Today is January 25th, 2020, and uh, we at the Hanson Historical Commission are very happy to um, have you here for our oral history project, uh, where we are interviewing distinguished members of the Hanson community. Uh, and we're going to get right into this, and basically what we'd like to do is just have you give us some um, history about your life here in Hanson. And um, we'll start with if you could give us your name, uh, your date of birth, uh, your place of birth, and your current age. Oh, well, my name is Alan Clemens. Uh, I was born on August 11th, 1938. I was the second son of Lucy and David Clemens. I was born at 417 High Street, uh, with a house my father was in the process of building, and I was born at home. Uh, it was, I was a breech birth, and I weighed 10 pounds, and they could not get a hold of the doctor. So they finally did get a hold of the doctor, but after that, my mother said, no more home births. And after that, she had six more children, and they were all born in the hospital, naturally. Um, we grew up, and it was quite quiet. It was, uh, the, the, it was during the Depression, and of course, that was followed by World War II. And growing up in the neighborhood, things are fairly quiet. There's very little traffic because the gasoline rationing. And we had a, a fire tower built by the state across the street, built in 1915. And it's 152 foot elevation there. And the tower is another 90 feet. So it was kind of interesting, quite a magnet for us kids. And, we'd, and the, we used to be friends with the fellow that, that ran the fire tower. We used to go up there all the time, climb the tower. And during World War II, there were soldiers stationed there uh, looking out for uh, enemy aircraft. And they boarded in the house next door to us. There was a, I think there were six of them, and they worked, they worked shifts. And they were older fellows that were, you know, weren't fit for combat, and they were, but they were very much able to you know, get up in the tower and keep an eye out for planes. And of course, we had blackouts then. So you had to shut off all your lights, pull down your shades, and walk, and you'd have an air raid warden for each neighborhood to walk around, make sure that there was no light showing, because the idea was if they flew planes, they wouldn't know if they were over land if there's no light showing. Um, we, um, we had a, a um, kind of interesting, um, uh, the neighborhood was very cohesive, and the fellow across the street, named Bob Rich, uh, he was kind of artistic, and he made a, a um, dummy uh, to resemble Hirohito, and they and he hung him from the big elm tree, and everybody came out and, and watched and applauded. So <laughs> that was the feeling in World War II. Um, now you have a very distinguished family here in Hanson. Can you give us your parents' names and your yeah. siblings' names? Well, my father was um, uh, David Clemens. Uh, his he came to town. Well, he, he actually he was he was born in Dorchester, where his, where his mother's family lived. But he but his father came to town in 1905, and he lived on Liberty Street, where the Heidi Hollow ice cream is now. And he induced my grandfather to build a house next door to him, uh, around 1913. Uh, and my grandfather went to work for Marcus Sharan as general superintendent of what was later to become Ocean Spray. And uh, he, he died very suddenly in 1948. It was very tragic. Uh, my, my mother's family uh, goes, goes back to, um, to uh, 1711 because she was, the, she was one of, she, her name was Keene, and she lived on Main Street, 1222 Main Street. And uh, she was descended from the Bournes, the Crockers, the Phillipses. Uh, and, and the Phillipses built that house, and my sister still lives there. It's been the family for... 300 years, 300 odd years, and uh, the, the front part of the house was torn down, but the kitchen remained, and the kitchen remains this day, and they built a new house on the front, but, but the stone under the, under the kitchen uh, di with the, the date 1711 etched into it, and um, I, think the, I think it's like 10 generations of our family has been in, descended from my mother uh, in, the, in the town. Uh, I'm one of six children. I have one older brother. And then I have, um, uh, Paul lives in Vermont. He was the only one that, that moved away. And then I have uh, my brother Richard, who's uh, three years younger than me, lives in Hanson. And my sister Charlotte, who lives in the old homestead. My sister Sharon, who lives next door. My brother Phil, 
who lives further down Main Street, my brother Brian, who lives on High Street uh, next door to the house my father built in 1937, and my brother Joel, who lives in the old house uh, on High Street next door to Brian. Uh, we have a bunch of kids, and a lot of them moved out of town. Uh, so there's uh, my daughter, I have two daughters. Uh, one lives down the Cape, and the other one lives in Swansea. And uh, I have three granddaughters. Um, I've lived in my house. I bought my house in 1959 when I was 21 years old, and it was a wreck. And I spent years and years fixing it up. And where's your house? At 671 Indian Head Street. My house was built in 1800 in Pembroke, and they moved it in 1861. Uh, this, this widow, uh, Pamela Lee Howland, um, moved it in 1861 and made it into a house. And it was, it was, I don't know if it was an old building or what it was, but it's very, very old. And uh, I spent years fixing it up, and of course I had the opportunity when they when uh, the intersection of Route 27 and 58, there was an old house down there, which they were going to tear, they were going to destroy, and I got the per permission to tear it down, which I did, saved all the material, and I used that as, when I was restoring the house. So that's all old material, and then of course they tore down the Garden Rest, which is where the Sullivan Funeral Home is, and I went through through the debris, and I got enough material there to make all my kitchen cabinets. So it's um, you know I've been. I've been very lucky to get a hold of a lot of old stuff that was, you know, I could, and I, of course, I worked for the, for the water department for 33 years, and um, when I came, when I first came, uh, came on board, it was probably a, a, a little over a thousand services, and, and um, the town was about, I'm going to say, 4,000 people at the time, and I was on for 33 years, and of course, during that time, we probably doubled the number of, of uh, hookups, and we also um, developed a, a well system so the town of Hanson has its own water system instead of depending on Brockton. Um, I also worked in the cemetery for a good deal of that time also, and I got to, I got to know, you know, a lot, I, not a, a lot of the relatives that were buried there. I, I remember all the gravestones, so I figured it all out. And my, my grandfather was, was a great historian, my, my mother's father. And he was, um, he had all kinds of records which he gave to me. And I used to spend hours talking to him. He'd tell me all these stories. And of course, his grandfather was built, was born in 1808 and always lived in town. And he was very close to his grandfather. So I got a lot of the stories that were, that, he, that his grandfather told him. I've written, um, I'm in the, in the process right now of writing a booklet and I'm incorporating a lot of the stories. So I'm not going to go into them now because I don't want to spoil it for you. You're going to have to buy the booklet in order to, to get the stories. Now um, you mentioned that you worked for the water department. What was the first job you ever had? The first job I had was raking leaves in the summit. Well, I, actually, I worked in the hardware store. My father had founded Hanson Hardware and uh, the same time he built the house and the same time he had two kids. And during the Depression, I mean, kind of a pretty good accomplishment, you consider it. Um, and where was Hanson Hardware started? Hanson Hardware was originally in the building right beside the big chimney on Main Street. There was an extension, which is now gone, um, which housed the Hanson Hardware. I guess he must have rented from Mr. Iran. And then later, a few years later, why the building across the street, uh, they moved in there. And they were there uh, for quite a few years until my father retired. And then my brother-in-law took over the business and he moved Hanson Hardware up the street to just beyond Elm Street. And uh, he eventually sold the business, but uh, it still seemed to be going strong. So it was, it was um, you know, you think about during the Depression establishing a business, that was pretty good on my father's back because he didn't have a car at the time either, so we walked back and forth to work. We didn't have a car until uh, 19, 1948, he bought a truck. Uh, a stake body truck, which we used as a car, and then in 1950 he bought a new a new Pontiac, which was really really something to have a car. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, of course he could borrow my grandfather's cars, but still, it was um, kind of interesting. I remember there was um, when I was really young there was a, there was a number of dirt roads in town. In fact, Home Street was a dirt road, 
uh, from starting from the corner of Phillip Street and down to the to the uh, house where Sean Keeley lives, where the moderator lives. And, but the middle part there was all dirt. And I remember walking down there with my mother and my grandmother and my, and my brother. And we walked down to Teresa's house, which um, a, a fellow named Drake lived. And he had a band. He was, he was that's quite- in, That's in West Washington Street. Yes. Like 517 and, and, West Washington. And he, was, and he had a big band there. And uh, he sold antiques. And in the band he had a wagon and a full-size white wooden horse. And there was a, hooked up to a fancy buggy. And there was a lady, a dummy of a lady in the buggy, all dressed up in high Victorian fashion, sitting in the buggy. And that was fascinating to me. And of course, he had all kinds of antiques there. And, um, but he was quite a character. And I, I, think, I think the thing may have been abandoned, because I don't know what year your, your parents bought it, 1949? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they bought it from his estate or what. but. But his family went way, way back there. I, I, uh, they may have even been the original owners. I don't know, but, but it was, it was kind of interesting anyway. And of course, there was, there was, there was all fields along, along uh, Home Street, small fields that they used to cut for hay, and all along High Street there were small fields. And when we were older, uh, we belonged to the 4-H club, and we had sheep, and we used to cut the hay ourselves, for the for the sheep. And we used to cut all the fields along High Street, and of course now there's all houses in them. But it was kind of interesting at the time, and um, we had we had a couple of old Model Ts which we used to pull the hay rake and the and the cutter. And uh, Gallon Brooks had a baler, because he, he was Marcus Duran's son-in-law. And we get all the hay piled up, and then we put it in the baler and and, and bale it up into, into bales for the for the winter. It's kind of interesting. And in fact, I have pictures of when when we used to do that. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about uh, when you and your siblings went to school and what schools you went to? Yeah, I went to school. I uh, started in Washington Street School, 1943, because the war was just starting. And I can remember we were, we were, we were told we, we, there was two school buses. One picked up the kids in Montpons and the other one the rest of the town. And we, would, and we, would, we were taught to... Uh, they would have a, an alarm, and we would all uh, go out in the middle of the hall, the central hall, and we'd all sit down with our backs against the wall in case there was a, an air raid. And uh, about that time, well, a year a year later, 1945, uh, they started a school lunch program. So we actually had lunch served at the school, which was was a kind of a big deal for us. And uh, I can remember when I went to school there, the the field next door, there was an old man, old Mr. McLaughlin, he lived there, and, and I can remember him coming out of his house and going to the barn. He had a big white horse, and he hooked him to a plow, and he plowed up the whole field next to the school. And uh, then we came out of school, and he was sitting by his table smoking his pipe, and they said he always quit work at four o'clock, no matter what. But he, but he was, uh, but I, I remember and of course, it was all across the street, there was all uh, big hay fields. So it was kind of, it was kind of interesting. And, and, we, and uh, we, then I went, uh, I went there for three years. And then the schools began to get kind of crowded. So they had classes at the Grange Hall, the Thomas Hall, both of which are now gone, and the Town Hall, which is still there. And I went to the Town Hall and for fourth and fifth grade. And at one point, uh, we had fourth and fifth in the same room by the same teacher. And she was supposed to concentrate on the fourth once, and then, and then we were supposed to shut up, and then she concentrated on the fifth. But I listened to it all, so I kind of combined. I kind of took the fifth grade two years. And, um, th and, one, and they also had third grade upstairs. And, and uh, at one point, my, myself, my older brother, two of my cousins were were in, all four of us in the downstairs room, and, and my other cousin was in the up room upstairs. So, and we all rode our bicycles because we lived on I lived on High Street, and they'd come up from Main Street, and we'd all ride our bicycles to to uh, to school. And we had an old dog, and she'd try to follow us to school. So my mother would keep her in. Then my mother would finally let her out, but she had figured out how to get down there. So come recess, why, she'd um, she'd appear. 
And of course, the kids, all, all the kids loved her, and they were feeding her the lunches and everything like that. And finally, it got to the point where the teacher would allow her to come in and sleep under my desk. Can you imagine that nowadays? <laughs> but and she was, um, but she'd accompany us to school to sleep under the desk. And of course, it was pretty informal there. The kids would spend the recess most of the time uh, throwing rocks into the pond. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was pretty nice. And then uh, I went to Elsie Thomas School for a couple more years. Um, and my brother, my older brother Paul, graduated from there, the eighth grade at Elsie Thomas School, the last to graduate there. And the following year, 1951, we went to the Indian Head School, which was brand new. I went there for one year. And of course, at that point, why the eighth grade wasn't such a big deal, so the graduation wasn't such a big deal when I graduated from there. And, uh, but we, um, but I can remember when it was all, when we moved in, while the yard was unfinished, I can remember looking out the window when there was, uh, it might be a surprise to people, but there's a lot of boulders there, as big as a small house. And I can remember them digging huge holes in the front yard and burying the boulders. But you'll notice now, if you go over there, there's some with a couple inches sticking up above the ground. Anybody had an idea how huge those were? <laughs> but they buried them all, so. Hmm. And, um, then I went to Whitman High School. It was actually Whitman High School then. It wasn't, it wasn't regional. And we, the town paid so much for each child. And of course, we were in greatly in the minority then. I think there were, I think there were um, half a dozen Hanson kids in my class. And, the rest, and, the, and there were a couple of freshman classes, so, the, so the, we were divided between the two. And um, I never really enjoyed high school too much because it was, I was kind of an outsider, and uh, but I did. I stuck out my four years there, and uh, there used to be a late bus, and if you had, you had to stay a little bit late after the bus left, well then you had to wait until four o'clock, to take the bus home. So I used to walk home along the railroad tracks, and, it, and I would get home about the same time walking as I would if I took the late bus. So I'd much rather spend my time walking than, than. Um, than uh, sitting on the bus or sitting in school. Um, I was, um, as I said, my grandfather was a great historian and he, he gave me all his material. Well, I inherited it after he died. And, but he, he was, um, I'd always sit and talk to him and uh, he told, he would tell all kinds of stories. And of course, we, I, I was kind of interested in history at the time, so I, I used to, as a, re as a meter reader, I used to go in the cellars of all the houses in town. So um, at 1932, why Joseph White wrote a book on the hist history of all the town, the houses in town, and he, um, and he um, had identified them. And of course, I, I had been in the cellars, so I, know, I knew which ones he was, he was talking about, and, and you could kind of verify it. So uh, a few years ago, why, uh, we were looking at the book, and there's no house numbers in the book. So I went through and I, and I um, put house numbers on all the houses so people know where they are because it would say Colonel Perry or Captain Briggs who had been, who had been there in 1932, but that was quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. And they, so they, um, uh, we put house numbers on and the Historical Society republished the book. And the book is available at the Historical Society. So if you're interested in where your house, when your house was built, why, yeah, very, very likely it was built before 1932. It will be in the book, and you can learn a little history about it. Um, which I've, um, I've written a lot of stuff myself that I remember, and of course, talking to old timers. When I went to work at the water department, of course, it was down next door to, um, well, actually, the, in where the front yard of where Rockland Trust is now. And there was the highway department there and the water department. And, uh, we, um, in 1965, why Walkie bought the land and made a packing lot and expanded his store. So we were, so at that point, we were moved up to the area on Indian Head Street by the ball fields. And, um, but it was, it was kind of interesting because they're all old timers working for the highway department. And they told me all these tall tales of what they remembered. And of course, a whole different generation because most of those fellows had been born in the late 1800s. So they would is tell there about. A, is there a tall tale that is one of your favorite tall tales that you'd like to share? Well, I don't want to give away. 
<laughs> no, but uh, well, there was. Um, let's see. I know the camera's running. We're on the clock. <laughs> uh, we. Um, let's see. I remember the. Well, I, I can tell you a couple of the times the blizzards that we. I always plowed snow. I plowed snow for for some fifty years, and. Uh, we had some pretty good blizzards back in the 1950s and a lot of cold weather. So we, um, we would, um, I remember uh, up on West Washington Street, there's kind of a hollow where it comes across what used to be Cushing's Pond. And I can remember that filling pretty much level with snow mm -hmm. and nobody could get through it. You had to, it, it, they, finally, they finally got a road grader in there and they were finally able to, to break through. But there was probably a 15 foot drift there. Mm -hmm. And of course I remember the blizzard of 78 and uh, that was, it was strange. That was, that was not as bad as 2015 because it, it happened and then it kind of got warm and then it gradually melted and pretty soon it was all gone. But in 2015, it kept coming and coming and coming and we, and uh, day after day. So that was, seemed to be a lot worse. Um, I know we, um, we, um, we were called on a, a couple of times. Now my, my brother and I, um, we were we were down to to uh, Cranberry Cove, in the um, and there was, a, there was a couple of girls there, and they said that they um, they picked up a snapping turtle on the beach, and they were going to take him and let him go someplace. So they put him in the car, and he crawled up under the seat, and they couldn't get him out. So they went down to the fire department, and they didn't want to touch him. <laughs> so. They wondered if we knew what to do, so we took a couple pairs of ice grips and grabbed the edge of his shell and held pressure. And of course, he was strong, but he'd finally get tired and have to let go and be able to get him out from under the seat. And we, were, and we put him in the back of the truck and, and uh, dumped him in Wampaduck Pond and set him a corn. <laughs> but uh, a lot of interesting stuff like that. And of course, the, we used to read meters, and of course, a, there was no leash law then. There was a lot of dogs. And we had to make friends of most of the dogs. There's a few that you really couldn't, and we had a spray for those dogs. But, but, the, uh, but there was one place we, we worked. It was Arlene Street, and we would read the meters there, and we'd get out of the truck, and of course we'd walk one side of the road. And there was a little dog there that was um, a little German Shepherd. And we fed him some dog biscuits. So we'd walk around reading the meters, and any dog would come out, he'd go after them, protecting the guys that would give him the dog biscuits. So people would look out and kind of, what's these guys with a dog with you know? And he wasn't our dog, he just kind of befriended us. That was kind of interesting. And uh, of course, in, when I first started reading, we had, to, we had to go inside everyone's house to read the meters. And some people uh, really weren't much when it comes to housekeeping. And, uh, You'd open the cellar door, and the way they do their laundry, they'd throw the open the door and throw the clothes. So you'd get on the cellar stairs and it was going down like going down a ski slope. <laughs> now I've always been impressed by how much you know about houses in Hanson. Um, anytime I bring up a house, you seem to have the history of it and um, you know have the background. Are there some houses in Hanson that are some of your favorite houses? And uh, yes. Um, it's interesting. I got most of my information from Joe White's book, and of course I've been able to confirm it because I've been in most of the houses. But the house on on uh, King Street, which is supposed to be the oldest house in town, uh, it's right on the town line, and that was built in um, s around 1695 or thereabouts. And I think um, it um, it's been changed. But one thing is the the beams are very square. Everything is perfectly square, and it and it and it has um, down cellar. There's a, a nice um, stone cellar, and there's a drain that goes off towards the street, which I presume must emerge down in the hollow there to so that, to drain the cellar. Hmm. And of course, it's been a lot of work has been done on it over the years, and there is a there used to be three um, buttonwood trees in the front yard. Two of them are gone. One of them's still there, and those are supposedly planted during the Battle of Bunker Hill, because they said when they were planting the trees, they could hear the cannons at Bunker Hill. Another one, across the street in fact, I think is built with timbers 
from an older house because all the floor joists have these long notches in them. And the way they used to build houses, would build, they would notch out and they would take three inch plank and they would insert both ends in the notch and they'd, and they'd be all made of vertical planks. I suppose, I, I haven't, um, I saw a house in Middleborough like that, but I've never seen any in town. But of course that house is newer. That house was built in the early 1800s. Um, as a house on West Washington Street, down by the river, used to be a beautiful house. That's, I think, the second oldest house. That was built in 1704. And it was, um, it was uh, damaged by a fire. I'm going to say it must be 10 years ago. And at the time, the fellow that I think he still owns it, uh, he was trying to rebuild it. And the building inspector we had was kind of a difficult chap. And uh, he wanted him to bring the whole house up to standard. Of course, it's an old house. And you can't take a, a house of beam ceilings and raise the ceiling four inches because it's just not possible. So I guess he kind of gave up. Although he's got the house covered with plastic. I don't know what the shape of it is, but it's a shame because it's a, it's a really old house. And, it, you know, it's a, it, um, it's um, could be beautiful if it were fixed up. But I don't know what the situation is inside. But um, another one is, um, well, let's see. There's... There's the Cushing House, which is uh, up near, let's see, I think it's Dan Dell Contract. It used to be a Pontiac garage, and that was built by uh, uh, Elijah Cushing. And I I always knew he was a very wealthy man. I never knew why. And now I realize it was because he ran the, uh, there was a iron mill on the Indian Head River. And they at, at the at the corner at where State Street crosses the river, and there was an industrial complex there. And the, there's a fellow from Hanover Historic Commission who who has located all kinds of bills, and he believes the original anchors for the SS Constitution were cast there. And of course, but Elijah Cushing was the one who, who and he was a very wealthy man. And to this day, you look at the yard, and there's a stone uh, in the yard. It looks like it's cut like a loaf of bread, and it's about I'm going to say two and a half feet high. And the reason that stone is there, because uh, Mr. Cushing was, I guess, vertically challenged you know, to say he was short. And in order to get on his horse, he would get up on the stone and then get onto the horse mm -hmm. from the stone because he, he couldn't hardly make it up off the ground. Um, there was, um, and also, when there was a gen General Benjamin Lincoln who received Cornwallis's sword at, at uh, Yorktown when, the, when they, the British surrendered. And he married Elijah Cushing's daughter in that house. Another house is um, uh, built in uh, 1763, uh, where Ruth Johnson lives on Indian Head Street, right across in the ball fields. And that house was built by one of the Cushings. And they lived there until, um, I think around 1820, at which point they sold the house and surrounding land to the town for a poor farm. And they owned the, the land that went with it was where the Indian Head School now stands, and the town forest and Camp Wampatuck are all part of the farm. And of course, they housed the inmates in the house, and they and they had a they hired uh, a, a man and wife to look out for them. And run the farm, and of course the inmates worked on the farm, or they, or whatever they could. The women, I'm sure, sewed and knitted and wove. And then, uh, in 1902, they built a, a new poor house right across the street. It was a big house designed as an apartment for, for, um, for in small apartments for each individual. And that worked out pretty good until the Depression. And at that time, where they thought, well, instead of having the people work, uh, we'll just have them go to the town hall and pick up a check. <laughs> so that was pretty much the end of the town of the town uh, town farm. So, in 1938, why my grandfather was one of the selectmen, and they designated a big portion as a town forest. And I think that they sold a piece to what was Camp Wampatuck. And later on, that's developed into a housing development now. And of course, the other piece, the Indian Head School. And of course, the town forest is still, we have about 30, 34 acres left, which goes from the road all the way to the pond. 
has a nice trail running along it. Mm -hmm. Now, one house that you have been very instrumental in say, help, helping to renovate and save is the Bonnie House. Bonnie House, yes. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Bonnie House, its history, the renovation process, and then ultimately the goal for Bonnie House. Yeah, well, the Bonnie House was built, as near as we can figure out, 1800. And, and, it was where, and if you could tell a little bit about where the Bonnie yeah, House is. It was is. built further down the street in the house where, uh, where it was located where Gary, <laughs> Gary Naylor lives, just down the street. Uh, and according to Joe, to, to Joe White's book, they built the house and they tried to dig a well and they couldn't get water at the, at the um, house. So they decided, they decided that they would take in and um, <coughs> and moved the house up the street, which they did. And they moved up the street and they were able to dig a well and get water there. And then of course, then around 1840, they built another house on the, on the same foundation that they that was first on. The Bonnie family lived there for many generations and they owned a good deal of the land which, which now comprises the county hospital. And if you go down uh, behind the, at the bottom of the hill below the water tank, there's a, uh, there's a big boulder, which is, was, is known as split rock. And unfortunately, it, there's a chain link fence there and it's on the wrong side of the chain link fence. But that, on the top of it, it's carved with a chisel. It says N. Bonny, carved on the rock. And uh, there's a spring further down, which I guess they probably, I, I think that may have been one of the main one of the catways that people traveled in those days of, that goes by the spring. But that was, but the Bonney family lived there for many years. And just to be clear, we're talking about Main Street? No, we're talking I mean, about uh, High, Street. High Street, yes. High Street. Um, and the Bonney family, when they, in 1914, Plymouth County was looking for a place to build a hospital because of the tuberculosis. And they figured a high elevation was the best and, the, and near the center of, of Plymouth County, which, which that fit. Was it. So they bought the Bonney House and the land and they built the hospital. They kept the Bonney House and they used to use it as a, as a uh, housing for nurses. And the, it remained there and there used to be a barn when I was a kid and the barn disappeared. And they, and they, of course they built all the hospital material, everything and it was, so when the hospital uh, closed, the town eventually bought it. And as we all know, the place of food pantry, as that survived, the houses that belonged to the, that they that were, were used by the doctors on High Street were sold to individuals. And the hospital eventually was demolished. But the Bonnie House was, was turned over to the Historic Commission with the idea that it could be restored and possibly used as a historical museum. So we started working on it uh, years ago. There was a lot of beams that needed to be replaced. It needed a roof. This was all done. Uh, I had the, the vocational school kids come in and they shingled the exterior. So the exterior is tight. Of course, the interior is gonna need a ton of work, but that remains to be done. But, it's, but the outside of the shell is, is, is fine now. And, we'd, and what eventually we'd like to do when that is completed is to move the buildings from Main Street. To right here behind us? Yeah, the, 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 uh, the schoolhouse. Behind it is the Hearst House, which was moved from Fernhill Cemetery. And there's a cobbler shop. And there's the old privy, which is the last remnant of Thomas Hall. Hmm. And if those could be moved up there and sited properly, together with the Bonnie House, it could make a nice historical museum. Uh, the schoolhouse right now is jammed full of town artifacts and it's packed so tightly that you can't see half of them. And we figured if we, put the, if we have the Bonnie House available, we'd be able to set up uh, more of a museum exhibit so you could look and see some of these articles instead of being all tucked away in corners. But that's down the line. Everything takes a lot of time. Anytime you do anything for the town, it takes twice as long as it would for anybody else. But Is there anything in the, um, that the Historical Society has on any of the artifacts that you think are particularly noteworthy? 
or maybe one of your favorite? Yeah, it has a violin. In fact, I think it's in a private home right now, but it's worth a lot of money that was built by Seth Miller Briggs, who was, a, who was um, well known as a violinist. And he uh, finally, when he was in his 70s, he moved down to, to, um, to uh, Pleasant Street uh, he, and said to live out his final days, which he did. And he had a, and he had a music school down there. He taught violin. And we have his violin. Uh, we also have um, my great-grandfather's eyeglasses, which I have no idea how they got there, but they're labeled. So I don't know who donated them, but they're there. Uh, there's, a, there's a crutches, there's, there's shoes that oxen used when they were logging in the cedar swamp. They were a big, wide platform so the oxen wouldn't sink into the mud. Uh, we have signs advertising uh, grand uh, events such as the ball, the fireman's ball, <coughs> which is the Thomas Hall, and various torchlight processions, and uh, special trains to Plymouth and so forth. And, the, and uh, we have Civil War flags, we have some Civil War drums, <coughs> a lot of things like that, personal, you know, uh, chairs from various houses and some clothing and, and some old uniforms. It's, but it's um, kind of interesting. Uh, we have a, a clock that was um, donated. Well, we actually, we bought it. We, we paid to have it shipped. It was an old gentleman that my acquaintance, who was about pal of my grandfather's, his name was George Elliott, and he was, he was uh, a steam engineer like my grandfather. And he was, uh, and he came, he, he retired, and he came back, built a house on West Washington Street, and uh, he had a clock that belonged to his grandfather. Grandfather's name was Wells Elliott, and he, and uh, the clock was someplace in, o in o I believe Oklahoma, and we were able to we had to pay to have it shipped back here, but we have the clock now, and we and it, it's got his name, and the date he gave it to his wife as a gift, and it's hand painted glass, so we had it looked at by a person who was interested in clocks, and he said uh, actually he says. He gave it to his wife like in 1870, and the clock actually dates to something like 1817 or thereabouts. It's a much older clock, oh. so it's, that's an interesting artifact we have. Um, but You mentioned um, that you have some signs that talk about events that happened. Um, as you know that here in 2020, this is our 200th anniversary of mm -hmm. Hanson. Um, do you have uh, some memories you can share about events that happened in Hanson or uh, certain traditions that happened in Hanson that you think are special? Yeah, well, I, I didn't, I wasn't here for the, for the 1920, uh, but I was here for the 150th. And I know we had, we had uh, a lot of interesting things. They had, a, they had dinners and they had, and they had a parade. And one of the things I remember particularly was they had a giant flag American flag, and they had it down to the to the um, town hall, and I guess just about everybody in town came down. Everybody grabbed a hold of the flag. You know, we spread it all out, and they took a photograph from a helicopter, and uh, they had another flag that was another flag, a little smaller flag, still huge, and they hung that from the from the uh, the ladder truck with the ladder fully extended. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting day. As a kid, what were some of the events in Hanson that you looked forward to? I always enjoyed the Memorial Day Parade. We used to walk down, and of course my grandmother would, would decorate the graves. Um, they, um, we, I, I knew that, <clears throat> I knew that we had about six generations in the area up front. My mother's family, the Keens and the Crockers. And um, then I found out that there's two more generations buried up on, on uh, Burial Hill, which is the old section. My great, 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 how many great grandfather and his parents are buried there. What are their names? Uh, his, name was John, was, uh, his name was Isaiah Keene, and his father's name was also Isaiah Keene. Hmm. And his, because um, that was names that were in our family. We, nobody's been named Isaiah, but Lydia, his wife's name was Lydia. And of course, my great-grandfather's sister, who I just barely remember, her name was Lydia. 
And of course, my, my brother Phil, his granddaughter is named Lydia. So we can't keep it going. In the, in the, another one is Lucy. My uh, great grandmother's name was Lucy. My mother's name was Lucy. And my, uh, my niece uh, lives in New Hampshire. Her name is Lucy. And I think, I think my brother Phil, I think his youngest granddaughter is named Lucy. So we keep the names going in the family. Um, what is one of your favorite places in Hanson? My own house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been there for 58 years. And I, the reason I bought the place, uh, mainly well, because I could afford it, and the other reason was it had a nice barn. And of course, I always, I always enjoyed the barn, a great place to store furniture. And I put the car in there when it snows. And um, I have a workshop. And I have a sawmill and I have a garden. And uh, there's plenty to do right around my yard without having to travel too far. And um, I still, I, I worked, as a, I had my own carpentry business for 25 years. And I pretty much retired when I got my late 70s. And uh, then this last year I had Lyme disease, so that kind of affected my mobility a little bit. So I'm pretty well retired now. And we, but I do a lot of, a lot of, of history and so forth, and we, and I, when I hit somebody to drive me, while well, we we travel to a lot of these places, historical places, I'm interested in seeing because there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I don't think you could live long enough to to um, see all the all the uh, places, you know, with, within a driving distance, the historical places in the area. I um, I have um, I've got a lot of my great grandfather's tools carpentry tools, and I have an adze and a broad axe that belong to my great-great-grandfather. So it's, uh, of course, they used to hew beams out of a tree with axes, and I have a sawmill to do it, and I can do it in five minutes. It would take them all day to do. Um, but it's, uh, it's interesting to, you know, to, you know, just to, uh, I built stone walls all around my property. Can I work for the town? We used to pick up stones, and I bring a couple home with me every day. And uh, I dug up a lot in my yard, and I've managed to surround pretty much all my property with a stone wall. And one and uh, one day, when we were in New Hampshire, a tree came down on the house, and uh, that was kind of a good thing because I was pretty good at carpentry, so I just took the insurance money and I was able to square off the south end of my house with the insurance money. And then some years later, um, a, a car went out of control and hit the paper boy and came right into my living room. So it just took out the front wall, but of course the house is all post and beam, so it never sagged or anything like that. So uh, I got insurance from that and uh, rebuilt the front wall of the house. And of course I had torn down the old house. So I had material that was compatible, same kind of material. So I just used the same material and rebuilt the front of the house. And uh, then a few years later, I built a stone wall right in front of the house because I had it on both sides, but I figured it was a good idea to have it in front of the house. And I figured if somebody hits the stone wall, it might slow them down a little bit so they don't go into the house. But so for the record, can you state the address of your house? Six, uh, uh, 671 Indian Head Street. Okay. And uh, I have a brick driveway, which I picked up bricks for years and years and years, and I did the driveway with bricks because I, I, uh, I don't like hot top driveways, but it's, it's nice to have a driveway you can walk on without picking up the gravel. And uh, we used, I had, when I was younger, we had chickens and we had sheep. And uh, it was, it was, um, it was kind of fun, you know, but it's a lot of work to get up in the morning and have to feed the animals. So we 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 finally wound up with just a cat, and finally the cat went, and now we have no animals. Hmm. So it's, uh, but uh, I always burn wood, and I still burn wood. And uh, my family has always burned wood. In fact, we when when I grew up, my grandfather had, had burned wood, and and, uh, and my father burned wood. And we and when he when he had the hardware store, he used to sell the Ashley stoves, and he was the only one around selling them. He sold hundreds of them, and they uh, they're a very popular item because of course the oil crisis was upon us. Mm -hmm. And down behind me, where they 
the new development, that's uh, Indian Trail, Indian Path, all the houses are electric heated. And then when the, when the uh, gas crisis, the oil crisis hit, and the electricity prices spiked, everybody ran screaming to get wood stoves because they couldn't afford the electric bill. Yeah. Because it was like a couple thousand dollars a month some of them were paying. And right. they, it was, any, any kind of heat was cheaper than oil. Hmm. And then the electricity, rather. So we have about five minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, are there any stories about Hanson or um, experiences or thoughts about Hanson that you'd like to share? Well, um, I was on the Conservation Commission for a number of years, way back when, with Pete Nowazelski, and um, actually with Peter McLaughlin, who just passed away. He was just a kid, but he was very interested in conservation, so he was on for a couple of years. And we, um, but we, we were able to, to buy a few pieces of land. The state self-help um, program had just started, and we were able to buy uh, a piece of land on Winter Street from the Wens family and get 50% reimbursement for it, which was kind of good. And then we bought... And, and what is that property used for now? It's just conservation land. Nothing's being done with it, mm -hmm. but it can't be built on, which is kind of important. And of course, over the, over the years, we picked up a lot of land in the valley where the Indian had brook flows. And when they did the Brentwood development, why I was friendly with this uh, Matty, who was the guy, who was the superintendent, and he knew I was on the Conservation Commission. So he said, we've got about 20 acres of land. He says, it's, some of it's landlocked, some of it's odd pieces of land. He says, he says um, we'd like to, we'd like to um, give, it, uh, give, it, give it a time for conservation. So I think we gave him $2,000. And there's a lot of scattered little pieces of land in the Brentwood area that are uh, one of the things is the brook that goes through there and uh, the uh, conservation land, which, you know, is kind of a good idea to keep it, to keep it. And, uh, and of course, in Hanson, why we have a lot of conservation land, which can't be built on, which gives us breathing space. I don't like to be five feet from the house next door. And of course, the Hanson does not have uh, public sewerage. So of course, that limits the size of the, of the lots because you have to have room enough to put a sewerage system in. So that's one of the good things. We, we bought half a dozen pieces of land and, and uh, I finally had to get off because um, I was working for the town. I come home at noontime and there'd be half a dozen people waiting for me and had half an hour lunch break. And of course, if I didn't get back in half an hour, I'd get the devil. So um, I finally had to give it up because I, I just couldn't take the, the pressure. Because everybody would want to, we, of course, the Wetlands Act came in. We had to get a permit for, to fill any wetlands, which is a good thing. But uh, they hounded me. So it was, uh, but then it's since, been, it's since landed in good hands. Um, Elton Smith, together with Pete Nowazelski, uh, were able to shepherd it along for quite a few years. And they bought the land off of Elm Street there, which was, was going to be houses. And now it's the smith Nowazelski property, which is behind Ellen Stillman's. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, the, um, we looked at all the Cranberry Company property once as for sale for $330,000. I think there was like 1,500 acres. And we tried to get the state interested, and nobody was buying then. So then, it, of course, a lot of it is developed now. But, of course, part of it was the Burridge Pond Conservation Area, which later on the state did buy. And that was they bought that from Northland Cranberries. And, of course, there's, there's a boat... Um, I think like a thousand acres there, and 800 of them in Hanson. Actually, more than a thousand. Then, of course, there's Audubon land, and and other. There's a couple of other preserves there. So there's probably uh, between that and the pond, there's probably like three or four thousand acres. It goes over the Turkey Swamp in Plimpton. So there's about three or four thousand acres. That's all pretty much conservation land. So that's that's a really good thing. It gives us a good buffer on the south side. Mm -hmm. Of course, they bought the land. Uh, the the uh, Billings, Webster, Webster Billings Conservation Area off of uh, East Washington, where the town has put a, they're, put, they're trying to put a couple of wells in there. <coughs> but that was all going to be gridded off into houses, and it would have been so uh, concentrated there. It's a good thing to have a little buffer there. Yeah. And, uh, well, yeah. 
uh, thank you very much for, for spending this time with us. Uh, I feel like we have only scratched the surface. That's you have for sure. so much yeah. knowledge about Hanson. Um, and, uh, but we'd like to thank you for, for spending this time and sharing some of your memories with us. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it, and um, I, hope, I hope to have a booklet ready uh, with a lot of stories in it, which some people might find interesting. Because, of course, uh, we, we, a lot of the stuff happened before zoning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Okay.